everyone and welcome back to my channel and to our podcast listeners. If you're new here then hi my name is Nikki Drews and today we'll be exploring another macabre mini mystery and falling down the rabbit hole of whatever weird thing I've discovered whilst trawling the internet for strange stories and bizarre happenings from not just London but all over the world. Now, before we get started today, I just want to give you a heads up that this story is a little heavy going and that there are mentions of sexual assault, murder and abuse. So if any of those things might be too sensitive for you to hear about just now, then you may want to skip this episode and I'll see you next time. But if you are sticking around, then let's head into today's macabre mini mystery. If you're over the age of 30, you probably remember McAfee Security, which was installed on any computer that had internet access, and its incessant pop-ups from your childhood. If you conjure up in your mind an image of the person that created that software, you might think of a nerdy man in a tank top, but that thought couldn't be further from the truth. Add a penchant for deviant behaviour, an overflowing bank account, and just a smattering of methamphetamine, then you've got yourself one hell of a story and also, unfortunately, a list of crimes which allegedly include murder. John McAfee may have started out in the computer programming business as a bit of a nerd, but before he even started computer programming, he was getting himself into drugs. Born on an army base to an American father and a British mother in the small town of Cinderford in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire in the UK, in September 1945, McAfee had a disrupted childhood that involved travel as part of his father's armed services job. He was mainly raised in Salem in Virginia in the US, but has always said he has a strong bond with the UK despite only having been born here and not spending any significant time here since. Sadly, when John was just 15, his father, who had an abusive streak and an alcohol problem, committed suicide by shooting himself. Fast forward a few years and John studied mathematics at Roanoke College and got his degree, which ultimately landed him a job at NASA as a computer programmer just a year later. John only worked at NASA for two years, but given that he said he used to have a pretty bad cocaine habit by then, it's no wonder that he soon after had a succession of jobs which only lasted about a year or so. By this time, his now wife was also seeking a divorce due to his unruly behaviour and at one point his drug habit got so bad that he was found after snorting a whole bag of the hallucinogenic drug DMT and cowering behind a bin. Seeking help, he managed to get sober and got a job at Lockheed Martin, a company which specialised in defence programming, and it was during that job he was introduced to the world of computer viruses. John worked out how to beat these computer viruses, and as a result, he developed his antivirus software company, McAfee Associates. His software did work, but there was an element of fraud to some of his claims, as in 1992 he began talking about a virus called Michelangelo, which had the potential to infect millions of computers. And with the story being featured globally, sales of McAfee's software went through the roof and pushed the company into the stocks and shares market, showing up on the Nasdaq for the first time, which instantly made it worth millions thanks to John's clever marketing. The company itself had some interesting work practices, and employees were expected to work long hours, often sleeping under their desks, and encouraged to have extracurricular activities with their colleagues in the office, carrying out those extracurricular activities on other colleagues' desks, and the workers said there were times when working there felt like being part of a cult. John sold the company to Intel in 1994, 
which is why it always used to pop up back on computers back in the day for an estimated $60 million, which is an insane amount of money even now, but back in 1994, that's the equivalent to $105 million today. That's enough to buy just a few McCoffees. With his newfound fortune, McAfee got straight to spending and bought himself houses in some stunning locations such as Hawaii, Colorado and Arizona, to name just a few. He also splashed out on antique and expensive cars and bought himself a few planes, because everyone knows you can drive more than one car at a time, definitely fly your plane if you're doing that. He had a few other companies over the years, none of which seeming to last more than a few years without closing or becoming obsolete. He wrote books and had invested quite a lot of his money in the stock market. He also set up a yoga school, which sounds like quite a nice wholesome thing to do, but it wasn't long before there was a court case surrounding the yoga school as John was accused of stealing someone else's teachings, but the case never came to fruition, and after a short while, the school was closed for... reasons. So now is 2008, and the world is falling apart. Closing numbers on the markets today. At one point, the market fell uh, as if down a well over 700 points. Apple shares are just getting hammered this morning. We're down by between three and four and a half percent. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. We're red everywhere. We're down over 16 percent. The stock market is now down 21 percent. We're now down 43 percent. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? So with the economic crash now affecting investments and also tax payments and with a number of lawsuits being filed against him for all sorts of things, including someone dying whilst flying one of his planes and someone having been injured in a fall on his New Mexico property, McAfee decided it was more financially viable to dip out of the country, sell all of his belongings and move to Belize in Central America, where he purchased a beachfront villa where he could lay low with his long-term girlfriend, Jennifer, and live out his retirement. However, this is John McAfee, so laying low isn't really something he knows how to do. Belize is a stunning place. It has blue Caribbean waters, dense jungle, and generally looks like what you would draw if someone told you to do a sketch of paradise, so I can see why John would want to move there. It does have some troubles though, as there are gun and gang violence problems, but relatively it's said to be a fairly safe place to live, as long as you're not involved in a gang. Settling into island life, John started up several businesses, including coffee distribution, water taxis and a cigar making company, and also bought an area of land where he had several bungalows built, turning the area into a compound of sorts. Whilst at lunch one day, he bumped into a microbiologist, Alison Adonisio, who was on holiday in Belize, and the two began chatting about her research into antibiotics and how she was working on making plant-based versions of them. Believing she had a viable and functional model to use the native plants in Belize which would create a new class of antibiotic, which if worked, would be a scientific breakthrough. Jordan backed her project financially and helped her to become established on the island, paying and building a research lab for her. Alison went into business with John, forming a company, and she moved to the island in order to continue her work, and if the research produced the antibiotics they were trying to make, then they would be set to make a lot of money something which John was interested in doing so amid rumours and also his own confession that his cash flow reserves were starting to run a little low. However, it didn't take long before Alison began questioning her decision to move to the island, as John began talking about how he had plans to take over Belize and run the country, which obviously started alarm bells ringing in her head, and she was suddenly concerned about what she'd got herself into. It's not known exactly when John started taking drugs again, but it was clear whatever he was on was having an effect on his mental clarity and his paranoia about his place on the island was becoming a little concerning. Also, in a weird turn of events, he began using testosterone injections once a fortnight. He said to help with his ageing and began frequenting a bar that was known as a house of ill repute. After declining the owner's offer of girls for him over a number of weeks, He turned up to John's house one night with a 16-year-old girl called Amy. Amy told him her story and that she'd been used by her mother to earn money by selling her body from a young age. John could recognise himself in Amy as he too had undergone an abusive childhood, and as such he was completely taken by her, but instead of helping her and, you know, paying for school or maybe giving her another option other than prostitution, he began sleeping with her around a few months later. 
Amy had already marked John as a good target to steal from, and so she was well aware that she could use this dire situation to her advantage. By this time, John's girlfriend Jennifer had become suspicious of what he was up to, and when discovering he was sleeping with a 16-year-old, she left him to his own devices and left the island. Over this time, John began amassing a harem of women which all came from the same bar. The girls were paid to be at John's compound and were often asked to carry out some pretty deviant behaviours, which I'm not going to go into detail here because I would like to grow my YouTube channel and my podcast and not instantly run it into the ground. But needless to say, these were things which weren't normal activities they'd been asked to carry out by any previous clients of theirs, but the girls said they did them as they wanted the money, with one citing that she needed the payment in order to be able to finish school. It's a sad state of affairs that she clearly had to do this, and that John wouldn't just give her the money for her education, a pretty damning indictment on his character. Amy became increasingly annoyed and jealous at these new girls on her turf, as in her eyes she'd mark John, and if anyone was going to take his money, it was going to be her. So one night whilst John was sleeping, she took his gun, standing at the foot of their bed, ready to shoot him, but as she pulled the trigger, she missed, later saying that she just couldn't kill him. Now, like any functional relationship, when your spouse tries to kill you, and deafens you in one ear, in the process, you build them a house. Obviously. Moving Amy out of his home, John built a house for her about a mile away from his, but Amy didn't want to live in the town as she knew it was quite a dangerous place to be, with a lot of gang violence and drug-related problems, and many of the men were known to her, so she asked John to simply kill them all for her. Obviously, this wasn't really an option, but after some delving, John discovered just how corrupt the town was, and as such, his paranoia continued to escalate in combination with Amy's thirst for revenge. Now, weirdly at this point, most people would have just peaced out and moved on elsewhere, but given John that was somewhat protected in Belize from being caught for his many lawsuits that were pending against him in America, he continued on with the situation, saying that he was in love. In a weird power trip, he built a police station equipped with a prison inside it in the town to help with the crime problem, and then instructed local police to begin arresting the men that Amy wanted rid of. He bought them multiple weapons, ammunition and tear gas to help with the arrests as well. Now, as he was paying the officers, he had control of who ended up behind bars, but as the town wasn't actually a drug trafficking hotbed like Amy had claimed, all John had managed to do was create his own security force, claiming dominance over that area of the island, which understandably put him under intense scrutiny. John said that he was now being watched by the big pharmaceutical companies as a result of his work with Allison into the plant-based antibiotics as he'd been seeing men lurking around, staring at his home from a distance, but no one ever came to talk to him about what he was doing. Perhaps this was true, or maybe it could be a result of his increasing paranoia. The fact he'd made a laboratory was also of concern for the local authorities, and they thought he was trying to make methamphetamine. Now, having looked at photos and footage of John over these years, there are some marks which start appearing on his skin which look quite a lot like they might be a result of potential methamphetamine use, which have since cleared up in later photos. But who's to say, these could just be liver spots from age, or another skin condition, I'm not a doctor, and I'm not saying he was making the drugs, but he may have possibly been taking them. John subsequently began employing the town in various jobs and creating opportunities for people, giving food to families and saying he was trying to clean up the town, but some of this may have perhaps been an attempt to curry favour with the locals. Now completely embroiled in the paranoia that was also being fuelled by Amy, who was playing him tapes of recordings of people saying they wanted to kill him, John was descending on a downward spiral which saw him burn the bridges of most of his businesses on the island and creating his own web of deceit and making his part of the island a scary place to be. When Amy had a man fire a gun outside her home, she told John about the occurrence, and he then decided he would find out where this man lived, go to his home where his family were, and when he didn't find the man there, he threatened everyone living there, saying he wanted the gun the man had used surrendered to him, or else there would be consequences. 
By this time, his biochemist business partner Allison was now feeling the encroaching paranoia from John and felt that he was making things too dangerous for her to remain on the island. He became very paranoid. He was talking about taking over the country. And I started to think, this guy is a madman. Everybody I hired was an ex-felon and had spent half of their life in prison. It sounds like that's a recipe for disaster. They never shot anybody, they never even shot at anybody, never even pointed a gun at anybody because they were dangerous people. He called them hitmen. He told me repeatedly that he could have people hurt, taken out, if he wanted to. And as such, she decided she would end the partnership and move back to Boston. It would later be revealed in a documentary made for Showtime called Gringo that on the evening when Alison broke the news to John that she was leaving, he allegedly drugged her drink and then raped her. Alison, when trying to report the alleged sexual assault once back in America, was told that there was nothing that could be done as it had happened in Belize. John was now controlling the town of Carmelita down the road from him where Amy's house was and was becoming a feared presence in the town and seemed to be amassing quite a gang of men to protect him, such as police and ex-gang members, making him almost untouchable. By this time, he'd also been posting on pro-drug taking forums that he'd been experimenting with purifying the compounds found in bath salts, which are a designer cathinone type drug, made mainly from methylene dioxypyrovalerone, also known as MDPV which you may remember from being everywhere on the news a few years ago as Meow Meow. The bath salts, he said, were the best drugs known to man, and as a result of his enthusiasm towards them, this obviously pricked up the ears of the authorities. With his blatant flaunting of drug production and experiments, law enforcement decided to take a peek at John's laboratory on the island, and were given orders by a higher power to take a look at what he was up to, and his home was raided by the gang suppression unit, to investigate the drug-making allegations and also John's involvement in now seemingly running a gang. The raid uncovered a stash of illegal weapons, stashes of cash and chemicals which were unknown to them, but no illegal substances were acquired during the raid, but unfortunately the authorities did shoot John's dog, who tried to protect him when the unknown men entered his property. As a result of the raid, John now believed that the government was definitely out to get him, and that it wouldn't be long before he was shot and killed, so his security presence increased, and with it, so did his paranoia. To protect his home even further, John bought eight dogs who patrolled the area outside his home and weren't always inside his compound. A neighbour of John's, Gregory Fall, an American expatriate, was growing increasingly annoyed by John's dogs as they would bark at all hours of the day and night and also be often on the beach doing what dogs do and pooping everywhere, but also being aggressive to passers-by. This was a particular annoyance for Gregory who had to walk past the property every day and when his friends would visit, they too would be intimidated by the dogs and never knew if they were going to be bitten and in a country where rabies is still common in animals, this was obviously a concern. Gregory spoke to John about his dogs, and in rage he said he would poison them if John didn't do something about it, and sure enough, John proceeded to do nothing about it. One night, one of John's security guards found the dogs all in a terrible state, and meat scattered around, which the dogs had either been thrown or found on the beach. He alerted John to the situation, and upon seeing they were all suffering, he shot each of them to put them out of their misery. The next night, Gregory, who was asleep in his home, was shot in the head at close range. Whoever committed the crime didn't touch any of his belongings or steal anything, they just wanted to murder him. Now, as an aside here, if you've been watching me or listening to the podcast for a while, you know I don't usually touch on recent murder cases out of respect for the deceased family, but Gregory's family have said in interviews that they want their son's name to keep being spoken, so that's why I'm telling the story. As the number one suspect, John fled his home, and to evade the police, he strangely buried himself in sand and put a cardboard box over his head in the hope police would think he'd disappeared. What was it I was saying earlier on about methamphetamine? John said he had no involvement in the murder, but with all fingers pointing in his direction, he was definitely wanted, and if he was caught, he knew that he would likely be detained by authorities, and he didn't fancy a stay in a Belizean prison, which he knew would be a pretty bad situation. 
In order to evade capture, he illegally fled to Guatemala, where he inadvertently dubbed himself into the police. After journalists from Vice magazine, who were with him during his legal stay in Guatemala, took a photo of him and uploaded it to their website, forgetting to turn off the GPS code on the photo, which ultimately gave away the exact location of his hideout. Oops. Arrested and now facing deportation back to Belize, John suddenly had a heart attack and was rushed to hospital. However, this heart attack was a ruse, and it turned out he faked it to buy himself more time so he could be deported back to America instead of Belize and evade the potential murder charges against him. Now free to do as he pleased back in America, he was released without any charges. The next night after he returned, when he was in Miami, Florida, he was solicited by a 36-year-old sex worker named Janice, and the pair spent the night together, and within months, they were married. Maybe it was for love, maybe it was to secure him staying in the country despite him being a US citizen. Who knows? Things quietened down for a brief period for John, and over the next four years, he invested in cryptocurrencies and touted them as the next big thing in business, perhaps trying to use his tried and tested ways of hyping things up in the media to boost his own investments. He also had a failed attempt as running for president. His tax evasion then caught up with him and he was issued a subpoena to reclaim the tax, but as a result he set up shop in Texas inside a compound with armed guards. Later that year, his social media channels posted pictures online which showed him on life support in hospital and John said someone had tried to poison him. Once he'd recovered, he was then off again on the run on a yacht leading to Cuba after being tipped off that he was being hunted down by the US feds. He then got caught in the Dominican Republic in 2019 and arrested, but as it was looking like he was making friends with the prison guards, it wasn't long before he charmed his way out of prison and onto a plane bound for London. After having been on the run for several years, John was eventually arrested in October 2020 in Spain by the US and his tax evasion eventually caught up with him. As of now, he's still in Spain in prison, awaiting trial but what with Covid, he's yet to be sent back to the US. The story of John McAfee may be quite insane on the surface, but underneath the facade, to me anyway, it looks like a scared young boy who is still trapped in the abusive relationship with his father and has never got the help he so desperately needs. The way he's treated people and his alleged crimes speak volumes about the man he became, and it's enticing to make jokes about him, you know, I, I did during this episode, but all of that deflects from what is just an ultimately sad tale of a man who struggled with addiction his whole life and always exploited others for his own monetary gain. And where's it left him? In prison, which I'm sure was not his main aim. Do I feel sorry for him? No, as I think he knows exactly what he's been doing all these years and he could have sought help. Do I feel sorry for the people he's affected? Most definitely. At the age of 75, and with his health reportedly fading, I wonder if he feels guilty at all about anything he's done, or if he's just nonchalant about his behaviour. After all, every interview I watch with him, he seems to not be great at taking accountability for his actions, so who knows? And whether he's a master criminal, or just someone who's good at evading capture, jury's still out. All in all, it's definitely a macabre mini-mystery. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed that one and let me know your thoughts about Mr. McAfee in the comments on YouTube or on my social media if you're listening to the podcast. There is way more to add to John's story, but I just wanted to give you a brief overview of his life. So if you did want to have a look further into the sources I used to create this episode, then please head to the description box on YouTube or the show notes of the podcast. As always, a huge big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters who help make the show possible and in particular to Sam and Barry, our executive Patreon producers. If you'd like to help support the show as well, then you can do that using a variety of different methods, such as one-off donations, buying research items from the Amazon wishlist, or signing up to our Patreon, where you'll receive goodies, extra content, and also have your name listed in the show notes or read out at the end of the show, depending on which tier you sign up to. I'll leave the links of where you can check those out in the show notes and description too. I'll be back next time on the podcast with a full-length episode of Macabre London, but if you want to catch the videos I make on YouTube in the meantime, 
then please head over to my channel and subscribe as I'm really trying to grow my numbers on YouTube this year. So I'd love to see you there. And also come and say hi on my social media as it's always nice to meet you. And don't forget to leave a review, rate the show and to tell your friends if you think they'd like it. That's it from me today. Thank you for joining me for another macabre mini mystery. I've been Nikki Drees and I'll see you ghouls next time. <laughs> <laughs>